The last time I spoke here in this room, I might have spoken to about 12 people. Maybe, maybe it was 100 people, but the fact of the matter is there are many more people here today than there were on that day. So I suspect from that that our speaker today, Dr. Ben, doesn't need much of a um, much of an introduction because y'all came here because y'all knew Dr. Ben was speaking here. So y'all know Dr. Ben, is that right? Okay. But for the one or two people in here who may have been uh, astronauts and on the moon or something like that, um, let me just say that Dr. Ben has been engaged for a very long time in the work that is defined by the acronym SIMOTAC, a committee to eliminate media offensive to African people. Dr. Ben has been a one-man committee to eliminate media offensive to African people. And he spared no media in the, in the fight. Even if the media was called the quote, the Holy Bible, Dr. Ben was uncovering it those aspects of it that were offensive to African people. And he was not only uncovering those aspects that were offensive to African people, he was digging up and unearthing that information that was critical for the advancement of African people. The Bible is a medium. The Quran is a medium. The Torah is a medium. The Rig Veda is a medium. The so-called Book of the Dead is a medium. And all of it needs to be examined and elucidated from the perspective of advancing African people. Dr. Ben has been singular in this work. He is a historian, an educator, an engineer, a writer, and yes, relevant to what I was just talking about before, also a photographer. Dr. Ben takes his camera with him, and you'll see the pictures of the uh, great works of art, great works of architecture, and the people, you'll see them in his books. He's written many books. A couple of my favorites were Africa, Mother of Civilization, and Africa's Contribution to the Major Western Religions. As I said, I'm sure you're in this room because most of you have heard of Dr. Ben before, and most of you know him, and most of you love him. For those of you who didn't know anything about Dr. Ben until you heard those few words that I said, believe me, I'm only scratching the surface. Brothers and sisters, it is a great privilege for Samotap to have as our speaker today, speaking on lies and distortions, Africa revisited, the great Dr. Yosef Ben Yohanan. I would like to say good evening. I think that this subject matter is, for me, quite timely, because when I leave you after the lecture, I'm on my way to Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. What to me is the most important part of what we learn from the public media is what we retain and what we use as the gospel truth. And from the public media, most of us use 100% of what we read as the gospel truth, as if the gospel truth is truth. <laughs> the gospel truth is gospel. And that's the only thing about it. You don't need to call it truth because to whom it is truth. 
The biggest problem we have is truth. What do we mean by that? For most of us, truth is anything we hear and became accustomed to and have adopted and it's truth. Not necessarily what we have certified by examining. So it is truth that Christianity is the only true religion. It is true that Islam is the only true religion. It's true that Judaism, and I could go on all night by that, and I could get approval of each of those statements for many of you within this audience. And each of you would fight the other over those truths. And yet, no way in any of them is the truth. Because if it was an intrinsic truth, you would not have to fight each other or even have a controversy. The mere fact that you don't agree on truth means it is not true. <laughs> so let us deal with the things that we could possibly understand. Let us take, a uh, young man asked me when I was in the gentleman's room, not the ladies of course, just this afternoon, did I believe in one spiritual God, one God that was in charge of everyone. And since I know that the word God is masculine, I hesitated because I didn't know the answer to his question. Since it is, why should God be a man? That upset a lot of the women in here because you know that God is a man because you just call him he and him this morning. Or probably when you came in here. Since I don't, uh, I, have, I have no background in that, then I must equally ask, why was the question? The question is because it is bothering that young man as to the answer we read in a Bible. And our Judeo-Christian Islamic Bible established a kind of ridiculous position that we cannot get ourselves out. So therefore, God, to most of us, has to be a man or male-like figure. If someone will come to us and say that God is neither male nor female, we got problems. And if we say that God is a hermaphrodite character, worse problem. I didn't say a homosexual. I said hermaphrodite character. That means that God is both male and female. Well, you will find that when you go to Egypt, when you go to Sudan, and when you go to Ethiopia as I am returning. Because the deity, God, goddess, is always presented in along the Nile as both male and female or male with female. And you have problem. You have problem because along the Nile, God have intercourse with goddess and have children. Now you got problem with that. Because you know Jesus couldn't get anything at all. No, but, but Jesus could be saving everybody, dealing with men, dealing with women, in charge of operation, in charge of menstruation, in charge of uh, homosexuality, in charge of everything. Matter of fact, nothing can happen without God in it. Now, if nothing can happen without God in it, how come you, you're mad with uh, AIDS? It can't happen unless God wants it to happen. That's your statement. Nothing in this world can happen without God's intervention. And if God wouldn't want it, it wouldn't happen. But you can't tell me then, how is it that God got so angry and drunk the world the last time? <coughs> Leaving only one family. Forty days in the boat, of course, two of everything. <laughs> I was trying to measure that boat the other day. <laughs> and found that the boat is not as big as this building. Thirty cubits. 
is less than the length of this building and it had two of everything. It didn't have two <laughs> African lions, of course, or one. <laughs> we don't need to mention that. I hesitated because I know I give you a chance to figure uh, having the tail of one dinosaur would have been difficult, much less the body of a dinosaur. <laughs> I just want to establish <laughs> how we see truth. And truth, if we would say, to me truth, if we are going to talk about a God concept, would be the original of anything, as a matter of fact. So when I speak of the concept of a deity, I primarily dealing with one that comes from the center of Africa and among as one group of people, the people that you may call by the ridiculous name which the English call them, pygmies. Of course, the indigenous people call themselves Twa and Hutu. And in Egypt, they were called Sabinetos. In the southern tip of Africa, they are called, they call themselves Khoi Khoi and Kalahari. You call them in the southern tip of Africa, Hotentat, like the Europeans do. But you fail to remember that when those people were presenting to the world, their world, any form, any aspect of a deity, Jehovah, Jesus, no Allah was any way around. I need to repeat that again and make it more clear for most of you. I said that when the Africans in the central part of Africa was dealing with the concept of a deity, God and a goddess, no one in the world, any place in the world, even knew or had any idea of a God by the name of Jehovah, Jesus, and or Allah. It was thousands of years later that what the Africans had brought forth to mankind as a whole, those that were living, and I need to make this very clear, not a single Hebrew or Jew existed. Christian, Muslim, uh, Hindu, Buddhist or anything existed when the Africans on the line, along the Nile were already dealing with the concept of a deity. The most common at the earliest time was the deity symbolized, symbolized by the sun. Not the sun. Never once did the Africans preach that any material things or any other animal was the deity, but use these as symbols of the deity. Many of you would be going to Egypt quite soon and other places on the continent, and you would c go and come back with the same mythology that missionaries has placed in your mind. You would talk of the sun god and that the ancient Egyptians and others of Africa worship animals, birds, etc. And that isn't true. It is a saying, it is of saying that Christians worship the cross. And you know that is not true. It's, sim it's a symbol. When you see, and that the media present to us, I've just been reading some articles dealing with a conference in Canada in which many of the scholars, biblical scholars, particularly uh, biblical or archaeologically, archaeology, especially at this time when Passover is here, stated that there is no evidence, no physical evidence as a Passover ever happening that messes you up. But I'll make it better for you. There is no evidence at all in Egypt of a Hebrew people 
living at the time when they were supposed to, worst of all, being slaves in Egypt. There is no record whatsoever in Egypt of a Hebrew people, one of them by the name of Joseph. There is no record of a prime minister in Egypt by the name of Potiphar. And there is no record of a man living in any of the Pharaoh's home by the name of Moses. No record whatsoever. Make it a little better for you. The first Hebrew or Jew, whatever name you want to call him, and that I guess would make me anti-Semitic. <laughs> Until the Africans along the Nile were about in the 13th dynastic period that the first Hebrew or Jew, Avram, was born, and that would put us around 1675, let's be generous, that's 1700 before the common era, which you would prefer to say before the Christian era. Yet, you have facts, and facts upon which you work gaily, none of which coincide with the information I'm bringing to you. But the reason is that you have no reference, for the most part you had, I should say, prior to the revolution that started in the 1960s, died down, started again in the 1970s, highlighted by the expose of Dr. Jeffries, which many people are sorry now that they even touched because what they have done, instead of damaging Dr. Jeffries, they have brought to the forefront information which other people would not have known. <laughs> and now many people are going to, who had no intent of studying more about the Passover, the Christian uh, a crucifixion period. Many people who thought that it is Rome that had given them, most of us in here, and most of us outside of here, believe that we became Christians because we were lucky to be in slavery <laughs> in one Western colonial power or another. Very few of us have any idea that even Christianity started on African soil. We knew. And I'm not dealing with the, the principles that were adopted. I am talking about Christianity itself physically started in a place called Alexandria with Pantheus and Botius, two Egyptians, Africans of Egypt, using Greek name because at that time, Greece. Greek was the language most common in Egypt. And uh, uh, I want you to remind yourself to look at a map because Egypt, the last time I said a month ago, was still in Africa, <laughs> even though I heard, I heard it's in a place called Middle East. But it was Pantheus and Botius who started when, the, when they revolted from the synagogue and started an extension of what was a teaching that preceded Jesus by more than 4,000 years. Thus, when you see Jesus, you are seeing the rebirth of a person that existed 4,100 years before Jesus and Mary. If you call Mary Isis, and that's a Greek word, let us say aset, or ask. And you call Jesus heru, or you want to use the Greek word horus. And then you call Je Jehovah asaru, or asara. You will speak about three personalities or deities who gave you your Jesus figure. If you would take the story of 
those three Africans along the Nile add 4,000 years to your Jesus, 6,000 years ago then, you will have Christianity before Christ. That is hard to understand. What I'm saying to you is that when you go to Egypt with Sister Betty, I don't care who you go to Egypt with as long as you get there. <laughs> <laughs> because when you get there, you've got to go to Abydos. That's where I am right now. I'm in the southern part of Egypt at a place called Abydos. I'm in the temple of Setai I. He is the king, the pharaoh king, who was reigning in Egypt up to 1298 when he died and in one of the chapels next to a holy of holies this chap this temple has seven holy of holies and next to the left one upon entering is a small chapel that showed the immaculate conception of Isis The virgin birth of her child, Horus, 4,100. Not only that, you would be on the only holy land. I'm not talking about Jerusalem. I'm not talking about Bethlehem. And I'm certainly not talking about Mecca. <laughs> the last of the holy lands. I am speaking about the first holy land mankind ever knew. What's sad about it is that it's your holy name I'm speaking about and you know less about it than anybody else. Abydos was a holy land that the people of ancient time flocked and came to no less so than people flocked to go to Mount Arab Rat and the times when the Muslim have the great Hajj. Again, but we have the truth, and we deal with truth, the one and only truth. Yet we don't know this truth, the first of the truths of all the religious concepts. Religious concepts that we even carried all the way to India. Africans who carried it there now call untouchable. Yet, they still call them tumuls, T-U-M-U-L. And we call them Dravidians. These same untouchables gave to India, the Indians of the north, the Bhagavad Gita, and gave them the concept of their own Bible. And the Indians themselves, the Hindu themselves, noted the fact that they got the concept of their Bible. What else did they carry? They carry there. The worship of Goddess Hathor, symbolized as a cow. The same Hathor, which the Jews worship, the same Hathor, which Moses is supposed to have a fight with his brother Aaron on the mountain that you call the sacred cow. So when you go to Egypt, from north to south, south to north, you will see in the temples, most vividly in the temple of Nefertari the second at Abydos I'm sorry at Abu Simbel you will see her dramatically at the temple of Hatshepsut the funerary temple at Deher Bali on the west bank of the river Nile and most of all you would see her most dramatically in the temple dedicated to her at a place called Dendera. While we mention the name Dendera, and I look and see in the audience as most of the time the sisters predominantly, it is at Dendera that you see how the African presented the quality of the African woman by showing her as goddess Nut in the ceiling, giving birth to the sun, the sun passing through her vagina in the morning spreading its rays of light and within those rays of light goddess Hathor holding 
a sprig of what is called the tree of life. Not an anti-life tree, as you would find in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, a forbidden fruit tree. This is one of life. She smiles because the rays from the, the sun coming through the vagina of God. That, that, no, this is pornographic in, 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 <laughs> in, in, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This is pornography. You, you can't talk about rays and, and sun coming through the vagina. We don't, even ad, 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 we don't even admit to babies coming through vagina. I mean, if, if a woman wanted to talk about a, giving birth to a baby, she'd say, I had a child. <laughs> and that's talking to a husband. I'm not even mentioning her boyfriend. You see, she got she to gotta be a, a kind of afraid to let people know that a baby came through there, even though she came through one. You, you understand what's going on? And, and then, uh, most mothers are afraid to even admit that they had sex, married or not married. I mean, uh, you can understand how these things could get. But the ancient Egyptian along the Nile had no problem with any of this. So when you planning to go to Egypt on the walls and on the, on the columns all over Egypt, you're going to see sexual expla explanations, not only by words, but by pictures. You will see God Mim, the God of fertility, constantly at all times when you see him. And you're going to see him every way you cast your eyes with a penis that's completely erected to the point that sometimes it has a curvature at the end. <laughs> but you will also notice that the ancient Africans, though showing the sexuality of the god of fertility, Mim, did not show the penis coming from his crutch, but instead coming from his umbilical cord, his neighbor. That's showing that the sexual intercourse not only is the deity, but it is life continuous. Because the, the penis is nothing but an extension of the umbilical cord. As I said, you can't deal with that today in the synagogue. You can't, couldn't deal with it yesterday in the mosque. And you certainly can't deal with it tomorrow in the church. <laughs> Yet it is the thing you should be dealing with tomorrow. Because without it, there's no life. And the resurrection scene, the first resurrection scene, as you enter the temple, Absetai 1 at Abydos is the resurrection of Osiris' penis from a dead horizontal to a perpendicular. The Masonic lodges read about this someplace, got messed up from England and France, <laughs> and while wearing a top hat, silk top hat, a wingtip shirt, a cutaway a jacket, looking like penguin. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling that they got something great. Not knowing the source and would not take a time to go to the original place from whence the whole concept came. Using terms of which they have no understanding. And that goes for the daughters of so and so and of ISIS and so and so, using of the, the such thing as the Grand Lodge of Luxor, and would not come to Luxor. They will go only to Israel and turn around. And maybe they would come to Cairo to see the pyramids, and they know pyramids in Cairo. <laughs> the pyramids in Giza, the closest one, across the river from Cairo. Misinformation, misinformation, but still the truth. The only truth. And that is the media. The media is typical of our religions. 
It's typical of our theology. It's typical of our culture. The media only is a reflection of one aspect, a bad reflection. Of course, we got to deal with it. But I'm just trying to show you how damaging it is. It is as damaging as the information we get sitting down in the pew on Sunday, sitting down in the pew on Saturday, and sitting down in the pew on Friday or any other time. Now, before you get mad and leave and say that man is anti-religious, <laughs> I'm not. I know you don't believe that. You believe that. You believe that I'm the antichrist. <laughs> but even that, I'm not. I don't have three names. Each name is six letters. So then I can't be the antichrist. <laughs> when I get when I get three names, each name with six letters, then call me the antichrist, and I'll be glad to respond. Thank you. I am different than that. My wife, up to this morning, said to me, Oh, God, Ben. So you understand what I'm doing? <laughs> so now, if you had any problem with who I am, you now know. <laughs> and I guess she wouldn't use that term unless it was real. Well, what we are saying, and, and I, I've done it in a little humor here and there, but what I am saying to you is that you cannot sit down home, you must go with Sister Betty or somebody, but somebody else, to very validate. Some of us come to Egypt, I mean to Israel, and then we come over to Giza, Cairo for some, and we go and watch one of the three major pyramids of the world. I said the world because there are pyramids in South America, uh, Central America. And of course, there are pyramids in Sudan. Most of us don't even know there are pyramids in Sudan. There are 82 in Egypt and there are 37 in Sudan. Otherwise, an area called Meroe. But the, most, the largest of all the pyramids, those of the fourth dynasty, about, around 2700 plus BC, before the common era, they will come to the largest one in particular, that's what most people like to go when they're going up inside to see nothing inside. <laughs> Just a good climb up about 10 stories, walking in this way. And when you come down, you come down in this way, <laughs> and at the bottom of it, your knees start to go like this. <laughs> Some people are saying, I'm telling you, they've been there and saw it. I stopped going up because my knee can't make it anymore. But they will come there and touch the pyramid, go up to it, make sure, look at the stones, see not one single brick made of any material and yet leave there and say, I saw the pyramid the Jews built out of mud and straw. <laughs> now, you talking about behavior modification. You talking about Pavlov dog. And name some other things. That is mind blowing. And you are talking about people that have been made to to think and act like fools. Because if you see the thing, you go up to it, you touch it, and you must still say that it is what you did not see, solely because you were told that and ashamed and afraid for someone to say that you are going against what is being told. You refuse to deal with reality. With, thank you, Sister Ben. Refuse to deal with reality. Yes, there isn't a single brick made of mud and straw or water. The pyramids you are going to see there, the stones were hewn, cut from a mountain about five miles away from those pyramids at the Giza Plateau. 
a mountain called the Mukata Mountains, and carried in the inundation period over there. People, we are so gullible that you will find people come to Egypt, some of us, to see the pyramids that were built from the top down. <laughs> what happened with the sky hook that was connected to the cloud? What happened when the cloud moved and there's no cloud today? <laughs> are you mean to say, they said, no, it was built by men with great minds who could suspend blocks? All right. <laughs> Look, let us see. The largest one is 48 stories high. That's about 481 feet tall. What happened when night came and they couldn't see the work? The poor guy stood and still suspended from when he on the 81st floor. Now they're down to the 80th floor. Then all underneath there. Till they, till they put the last, they stick the last stone underneath and, and drive it and shore it up between the earth and space. How dumb can you get? But again, we want to believe things that are not because it gives us the opportunity as to what Sister Betty and the brother, Dr. McDonald, were telling you just a while ago, it is better to say, I will read the newspaper than to say, I will do the work. I will read and see what they, they, they did. And I will say, yes, they're doing good work. But I will not do and I will not give towards good work. And that's why you get such bad information because you wouldn't do good work. It is worse than that. I, I'm trying to get African scholars, quote unquote, to come to Egypt, to Sudan, to, to Ethiopia, and elsewhere to do field research, first-hand information. But we are satisfied with taking out a book. We would condemn the European writer, but the European writer is in Egypt every day. He's in Sudan every day. Therefore, what he writes, he put his interpretation. Quite recently, some people at the University of Chicago have to admit that Seal, one of the greatest Egyptologists, wrote, uh, they found many of the things that he had written were complete and total lies. But they did not say that Keith Seal lied. Though they admitted it were lies, he made academic miscalculations. <laughs> and that's why many of the, my fellow, my colleagues at the university and I couldn't get along. Because if I thought it was a guy who was a liar, he's a blasted liar. <laughs> a damn liar. And I may come up with an MF flyer. <laughs> because I realize that the Pope can't make any rules for me to follow and tell me which language is profane and which language is feign. It ain't nobody more feign and profane than he is. So for him to tell me what I could say, it's just like you, you know, when I say some of my choice little four letter words, if I get hot enough, uh, then you said that man always oh, so dirty. What, what isn't dirty? If the word exists, I can't be dirty using it. It's just that I express myself with a sweetness of the Lord. <laughs> I speak the language of the people. Can you imagine Jesus coming here and said, Thou crowd, hitherest. <laughs> to create the quadruple and come unto me, to me yonder morning and I shall compensate thee. Now what the hell did I say? All I said, 
is take out the four-legged animal out of the cart, come in the morning, and I'll pay you. Yeah. Now, couldn't I have said that with all that nonsense I just said? No, but you like it better. Because you don't like four-letter word. You prefer to do it, of course, but um, you don't like it. You don't ever want to hear it spoken. But I speak it because Jesus spoke the language of the people. Give me some skin, baby. Well, I, you, can you imagine? Just look, Sister Betty, how good she look. Can you imagine Jesus coming to her at the morning, at the well, or anything? It ain't got to be the well. It could be anywhere. And throw his hand around her. And, and the, the, the juice, the magnet that's coming from her body and, and hit Jesus. I mean... <laughs> if he, if, if there might have been another Good Friday. <laughs> but you can't think of that term. Immediately you are thinking that he's sacrilegious. No, I'm not sacrilegious. I am conscious of the the, the, the integrity of the African woman, of the strength of the African woman, uh, uh, you, you understand me, brothers? <laughs> I know some of, you, some of you brothers may not know because you have never tried a black woman. But try one, it's good for your soul. <laughs> I said try one because when you come to Egypt, you're going to see how the African brother projected the African sister. The African brother didn't go around, man, I can't get me a good, uh, man, it's hard to get me a good black woman. I don't know, but I, let's go, I, I'll leave that for the, another comment. How can he say this? When no, when all other people in the world were not writing, expressing themselves. The African men were in the temple, were in the ceilings long before, thousands of years before Michelangelo, were in the ceilings painting the African woman as goddess. In one case, they painted the African woman as goddess Nut. Over the head of every pharaoh was a double goddess, goddess note, back to back, like the Caribbean song, back to back, I done dead, I got it, get it ready. <laughs> and, and up there, put stars on her body. And showed her of the goddess of truth and justice. In other places, they show her as the goddess of the universe, of the sky. And then they show, he showed himself as the god of the firmament, god of Yeshu. He called the goddess Nut. He showed the god of the earth, Geb, holding her hands and her foot, her feet apart while her body take the shape of a semicircle. And you know what the caption read? God's shoe has one hand. The right hand cover her vagina. The left hand cover the two nipples of her breast. And the caption read, Goddess Nut. as heaven. God's shoe covering the two columns of heaven. And you looking in the air for heaven. <laughs> and heaven, heaven gave birth to you. Heaven is the place you return as a man. Heaven is the place that makes you happy. Heaven is the place with the deep, deep, listen to your Bible, 
a deep. Where is the place that man came from originally? They said a deep, dark, right? <laughs> pit. Well, let us ask. Full of fluid brine. Well, let us ask. Didn't you come from there? Did it need Jehovah, Jesus, or Allah? No. Go back and check anatomy. Go back and ask yourself what it is that bursts when you are about to come here. And then ask yourself, when you beat her, kick her, and tell a bitch come here, bring your ass here. Go back and see if it isn't heaven you're talking to. Because it is there that that thing you call the placenta. So you see, that truth, you got a part of truth. But there is another side to truth that you haven't got. That side that we can't look of because of the roadblocks. We can't look because we are so conditioned by sexual stoppage. We can't talk. A woman cannot marry but cannot come to the, her husband in bed naked. She must come with all kind of clothes and then get underneath the sheet and slip this off and side that off and all this stuff. And he too, and he too. Because they're married but each are ashamed of the other. To see what each know the other got. Truth. It truth the reality of marriage. By the system, the culture in which we live. Marry, have a good life, don't touch the girl, come to the bed, virgin. She can, you can prove it, she can. <laughs> come to the bed, virgin. She's at a disadvantage. But uh, you come to the bed, virgin, then you have the, 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 you get a little exercise, you know what I mean? Uh, you can't even call it sexist in this sense. And, and then, but the baby, let's say, you marry, you went through all that. You, the man, didn't have any sexual intercourse, hardly touch your own self for a while. She, the woman, did likewise. You are pure. Me, the good for nothing. I like that name. <laughs> and I wouldn't say you because you're with the man. But you, the single woman who don't mind me touching you. They go up tonight in the honeymoon castle untouched by human hands, even their own. <laughs> we get up in the next honeymoon castle been touched by all kind of hands. <laughs> and we have a little bit, they have a little bit. But the funny thing is, truth, their baby is going to be born in the same sin as our baby going to be born. Now what, now what reason do I have not to get a little peace? <laughs> if, before the, before the wedding, if the babies, both of them, going to be born in sin. <laughs> Truth. And that's what we have to do is Truth, and the Bible itself said, is not an ending situation. Truth is an everlasting search for answer. Truth is the light, they said. And I don't think light is that important anyhow because, you see, light is substitute. Like the other day I was there and the brother, the connection, all the lights didn't work. And I said, oh, good, good, good. I'm going to get me a TV. And why not? Connection was ripping me off all the time. It was my turn to rip off somebody. <laughs> I believe in the 13th commandment. It says, thou shalt, if thou art African, get what thou want, what thou need from other people. <laughs> You see, I understand law, I, that the most important thing is black. So they didn't, there wasn't a blackout. You see, 
That's the difference between you and me. You say it was a blackout. It was not. It is always black. If the sun don't come, you got a black out. Everything is black. You, you understand it? If you're white and the sun don't come, you got a black out. I can't tell you white in the middle of the night when the light is off. Because black is constant. So when you say, they don't like me because I'm black, uh-uh. They don't like me because they're white. <laughs> you see, how can they not like me when I've given to the world the foundation of the concept of a deity? I've given the world writing. I've given the world the concept of high culture you call civilization. It isn't that they don't like me. Is that they can't deal with me. Uh -huh. So they call me the invisible man. I'm invisible when I quote the things that Diane Ravitch, you understand? Edward Koch, oh Edwina. <laughs> Slissinger and others and now we come to the other the zebras Dr. Gordon Edmund W. Gordon Henry Lewis skipped Gates I, I think he should have skipped Gates and others who know not these are the responsible Negroes colored Jigaboos and zebras. <laughs> they join because they feel that they're mistreated because they're black. Most of them would not even admit they're black. Some of them can't even find a black wife. After three tries, Garden needs to find. Someone who's black sisters need to sell, show Brother Garden a trick or two, but he might, get, might, he might even get uh, frightened like hell and run past Alabama. And <laughs> I, I wonder when he looked up and saw the black mother, he must have felt like hell day one when he was born. He must have what's that? <laughs> Somebody need to tell him that was a black mother making a mistake. No, you can't blame the sister. The sister tried. But you must say, some of us don't win all the time. We produce the Thomases, justice or not. All because they do not know truth. I think it was the, Pers the uh, Persian who said, in his poetry, all truth, all faith is true, all faith is false. And he went on with his poetry, but down at the end he came to the point, he said, that because each of us believe the whole, when you get a glass, the shattered glass, we get a little piece, you get a little piece, it's cut in our hand, but each of us is saying, my little piece is it. Yet it needs all the pieces to bring together to again make the mirror the whole. And that is what, why we cannot challenge effectively to put, it's not enough to put the post in financial difficulty. It means that somebody among us is buying the post. There's a traitor in the house. The cry went out that we don't buy the post 
I didn't buy the post not only. I don't buy the news. I don't buy any one of them. I don't do the, if you if you are against the people, my people, then you're against me. I have not bought a record by Diana Ross. I will not buy anything by Michael Jackson. <laughs> and for those who go, I see. When Elvis Presley, the date of his death, I see African young people, women, and men crying at his grave. I look at them and say, they got the truth. The truth says, do not talk bad of the dead. Why not? If a bastard was no good when he was alive, why should I talk good about him now that he's dead? No, that is no truth. That's somebody's truth, but it isn't my truth. I cannot speak good of Thomas Jefferson, though he wrote, be it resolved that all men are created equally. That dog didn't believe nothing like that. <laughs> and how could I, on the 4th of July, talk about the father of our country speaking about George the Nasty. <laughs> Lion George that didn't cut down a tree, no cherry. Martha wants him for inactiveness. <laughs> and even though Benjamin Franklin exempted himself from participation in the enslavement and the document, he did nothing at all to avoid it. So why did I take the position I'm taking here? Because I know when you take up a dollar bill, when I take this dollar out of my pocket, Sister Betty, let me know when it's time because I could go on and go on. I'll miss the plane. <laughs> you take on the green side, brothers, I know some if you're married or got a girlfriend, don't put you in a pocket. I, I got this one because I borrowed it. <laughs> Don't mind, I'm complaining, but I'm not going to get rid of her unless I got another one. <laughs> but on the green side, I know where George Washington and the members of the Continental Congress got the symbols. I know that the money, that the symbol of my God rock, the sun, which, don't forget, all of you, all of you Jews, all of you Christians, all of you Muslims, you got the same God I got because at the end of your prayer, you still say Amen. You still say Amen. Amen rock. The God of the North and the God of the South mixed together. You still speak of the eye of Horus, which Horus lost in the struggle of justice fighting against his uncle, said Typhon, for having killed him. You still carry the story of the man who fought, fought his brother and killed his brother, but you got the wrong name. You attributed to Cain and Abel, thousands of years before there was a Cain or an Abel, mentioned by anyone, because you don't have a Cain and an Abel until Abraham is born. The Jews brought the concept of Cain and Abel, but long before there was an Abraham, there was the fight between Sir Typhon killing his brother Osiris and Osiris' son, Sir Typhon's nephew, killing Sir Typhon in return. You're going to see that. You're going to see that in life size when you go to the corridor, other corridor at a temple called the Temple of Harris the Elder at a place called Edfu. It is the best kept temple uh, to date of the ruined ones. Yet they tell us that the, the, the Greeks gave us drama. How can it be when this temple you're going to see, they tell us 
that, that, that the, 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 the Norwegian and the Scandinavian gave us the harpoon. You're going to go there and see the story 4,000 plus 2,000 years, 6,000 years, and you will see Horace harpooning with a harpoon, yet the Swedes give us the harpoon. <laughs> but you have the truth. These are truths that you must write down in the classroom and get 100% if you put it. And Diane Ravitch would say that Jeffrey's got no business changing this. And Jeffries would not change it, but Jeffries went to the Nile a few times. And he saw something he couldn't refuse. Truth. Another truth. Truth of the indigenous Africans that were his antecedents. And that's the problem we face with. We face with it as you are faced with July the 4th. When you are going to go down to march for Cristobal Colon. <laughs> Cristobal Colon, who the Spaniards like so much, they put his behind in jail and kept him there until he died. While you stay here preparing with the motto and others and Ferrara and others and Como, all of them brothers and sisters who have to declare their whiteness because you were in Sicily, you were at the gates of Rome with Hannibal and you stood there for umpteen years and when the brothers wanted sex they did not catch the elephant and say come here sister elephant I want to be happy give me some heaven <laughs> No, the Italians are not dark because of the sun or because of wishful thinking. <laughs> They're dark because of a certain thing called black penis. It is not Othello and Desimone alone. Because Shakespeare wrote seven such plays with the Africans in a dominant position in the European uh, 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 monarchy. But more than that, we don't have to even worry about Shakespeare because, as you know, the Medici family could validate it. And you are an Aquinian and an our kind of statue, but you must remember that you once had a quote unquote Negro colored king that ruled this land. I'm talking about George the third, The George that George Washington, honest George, fought the other dishonest George, the George who could speak no English, the German George. The German George who was the great grandson of Alessandro Medici, Alessandro de Medici who was the daughter of Martha from Ethiopia and Pope Medici of the Roman Catholic Church of Christ. I don't need to, to deal with more. I mean, because I could go up to, for those of you who don't feel good about that, I could go up right there in Sweden and get the blunders of the blunt of you. Because to make sure that the nigga you sleep in bed may be yourself. Because <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Count Bernadotte that became Sweden's first king, a brother from Haiti. How did come to think about Haiti? <laughs> I mean, all of you should be kissing Haitians. Because when you kiss a Haitian, you're kissing your cousin. It is a Haiti that they brought your ancestors first. It was then called Hispaniola, Haiti and Santo Domingo. It is there the Roman Catholic priest Bartolomeu de Casas with the power of Pope Martin, of Martin V that brought Africans from Spain, not from Africa, Africans who had been in Spain 
for 774 years. From 711 to, 7, to 1845. Those Africans calling themselves Moors. Af what, I'm 14, Africans who brought Columbus in a ship, not to America. Columbus have never seen America, not Central or South. He saw the island of San, Fal San Salvador. That's the closest he came. And he didn't sail a single ship. Pietro Olanzo Nino was the, was the admiral of the fleet. The five ships that left, Columbus was the admiral of the expedition. In charge of the expedition. Uh, uh, Nino took over the helm of the Santa Maria and sailed the ship. How Columbus going to sail the ship and he's put in the brigs? by his men who revolted against him. He's going to sail the ship from the bridge? <laughs> no. Truth. There's them that truth, and there's us here truth. <laughs> so us here truth. Cenotaphs truth. It's got to be the truth. We are here to. It's our truth. Our truth that we have investigated. Our truth from which the blood flow. Our truth from which millions. Somebody telling me about people with a, with a holocaust. I'm not talking about a holocaust ending with a T. I am talking about holocaust ended with an S. The plural. I am talking about holocaust in which not one of us survive Tasmania every man woman and child is dead there isn't one left I'm talking about a holocaust that's still going on from 638 of the common era or 18 AH uh, the year after the Hajira by the Arabs to the present time that's the holocaust the Holocaust, the worst of our Holocaust, and I'm ending up for your question, the worst of our Holocaust took place here. The mind. There is something on the radio that says the mind is a horrible thing to waste. If you got one. Most of the people are saying that hasn't lost anything because they don't have a mind. If they had a mind, they would not have acted as they do. If they had a mind, how could, they, how could we not come here as we do when James Brown is around? Don't come here just because I'm here. The revolution doesn't stop when I'm not here. It doesn't go when I go. How can you get in the revolution, you say? You are in the revolution when you support your child. You are being revolutionist. You are in the revolution when the sister said, I missed my period. And you say, what happened? She said, I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> and you don't say, I got to go down to buy a loaf of bread for two years. <laughs> 22 years at the bakery. <laughs> You're in the revolution when you see a young brother, six years old, pressing his nose and his eyes and everything against the, the window at the restaurant or the coffee with. Didn't have enough to eat. You call him inside and you feed, fed him. You're in the revolution when a sister is in three foot of snow and the forecast is for six and the wind blowing and you drive in with your special car with traction, front and traction wheels. <laughs> and you pull up and say to the sister, happen. And then you don't ask her her name. You ask what is the address and you drop her. 
And you don't ask her what color drawer she's wearing. <laughs> and when she asks you, what do I owe you for this? Say, tell, your ma tell her, tell your man when you go home, he owes another sister right. something. Right. Revolution can be played out by every one of us. Sure, you, there are times when you come to the cenotaphs and the other places like that to coordinate certain action, but daily you have the responsibility for doing your own revolution and you start it when you find out that you're pregnant and you said, if I get a boy, he's going to be treated the same way as a girl. I'm going to start to talk to him inside my womb. And daddy, when you rub her on her navel, when you rub and feel the, the, the movement of the child, you start speaking to that child and say, if you're a boy, child coming out here, remember that the woman you're going to rape is your mama, that the woman you're going to hold up is your mama. You got to talk to that boy. You can't call that little girl just because she got one baby. You bitch, you whore, you slut. And then call your son who got a whole block of babies. Don Juan. <laughs> Rudolph Volatine. Now, the revolution is now, and Cenotop is one of the causes. Let me hear that you came there and did what you got to do. rush for the doors. We have some more business to take care of and Dr. Ben is going to be back for some questions and answers. What we have scheduled right now, we're going to take a collection, then we're going to have a comfort break in which we ask you to go out and support the vendors uh, who are out in the hallway and then uh, we're going to have a microphone set up in this aisle for questions and answers. When you're out on... It's upon the truthfulness of the times no different than a glorified post. I would wait until I hear, having seen, having witnessed what the president, the current president of Nigeria has done with making it obligatory for any African from the Americas, Caribbean and so forth coming to Nigeria is entitled to a Nigerian citizenship and passport and many other things of that nature, I would be quite surprised that it is only a diplomatic courtesy for the head of state of another country coming through. We must wait until we hear some of the definitive statements made by the president of Nigeria in quotation, then we can check with the embassy and if the embassy validate that that is a statement of the president of Nigeria, then we could be critical, you understand what I'm saying? Because the information by the reporter could be twisted and, and made to put us on edge, especially since these men have taken the kind of steps that they have taken thus far. So I would say, I, I don't know, I haven't seen it, but I would like to see the article and what you could do is call the cultural attache at the uh, at Washington or at the United Nations and ask whether or not the, the statement made by the New York Times that that government endorsed that as the, as the position of the Nigerian government. Then we can attack it if it's not appropriate. Dr. Mann, could you repeat the question because there's no amplification on that line? Oh, the question the uh, young gentleman asked was what did I think about this uh, behavior of the president of Liberia in 
hosting uh, the clock from South Africa. Uh, the president, the president of Nigeria, made in hosting the clock from South Africa. And I, my position, since I had not read this story, story, say, uh, statement or even heard of it, that I asked him if uh, he had validated this as being the statement from the president or position of the president rather than some reporter from the Times. And we, we, we must be careful and don't let us get, get, get us in a trap. I haven't heard of the statement or even that the clerk had visited. But he would be visiting many states. As time goes by, the question is what position that state is going to take. Oh, you got the bad? Not bad. Five. Well, I, I hope pretty good. <laughs> uh, the situation in South Africa between the Mandela, do you have any comments about their relation? I do not know the personal life of the Mandelas, uh, and I wouldn't have any comment on that. But I would say, politically, I don't see how they can stay together. Uh, one could differ quite a lot uh, in your personal life with each other. The position of Winnie as a fighter, when Winnie was here and the first time both of them came, if you recall, Minnie, uh, Winnie was interviewed separately and she was asked if the negotiations broke down between the clock and others, what would she do? And she said she'd go to the bush. What has happened? I recall very succinctly that the day when Mandela was re released from jail, I was at the exact moment on WLAB with Gary Bird. Everybody got excited and they asked me, Gary said to me, you heard what happened? They've just released Mandela. What you think about it? I said, I don't think anything about it. I said, it just means that Winnie would have a man to sleep with and Mandela don't have to masturbate any longer. Uh, I repeat that statement. What we seem, we, we are quick, but we don't, I, I just talk about truth. What Mandela did, he was in jail for 27 years, but he met a, mem a man of the PSC there 11 months before and came out the same day with him, and nobody's accusing the man's name. He's now dead. He died two, two weeks after he came up with TB, a member of the PSC. But I ask you, why was Mandela in jail? He was in jail for contempt, not for activities that he had done anything. In a case, he represented a man, and he refused to divulge what the man had told him, as the, the, the matter of client, uh, a client between a, a attorney and client privilege. And he refused, and he was sent to jail for all this time. Not because he was a militant man that was putting up a struggle, armed struggle, against, but then look at the record of Winnie. From a girl, she has always been a woman who has put up a struggle against, physically and otherwise. Now, it's, it's true. I don't see how both of them could live in the same house. Now, it was different, you see. It's 27 years passed between these two people. Winnie has 27 years of growth, independent as his and outside, in an armed struggle to ask her to put down arms, or anybody else, to put down arms for a negotiation that gave nothing and they surrendered the arms already. So the only people fighting is the, uh, there in the field, the PSC and a few other little groups, not the ANC. When it's caught in a problem, another problem, the ANC has white officials, such as the treasurer. Once it had the, the, the and now the, the head of the, uh, the commander of the armed forces of the, P P of the ANC is another white man. So how I could see in the uh, Winnie's dilemma. And then he comes out and said, we laid on arms. And that South Africa 
one man, one vote, and the whites should be guaranteed. I mean, guarantee for what? They should be guaranteeing a bullet. One bullet. One. I back many, I back winning a hundred percent in this dispute. He said, you got to speak louder. On my way to Cape Coast, in Ghana, I run into this place called Mankison. Right? And in Mankison, they showed me this picture here that, that, uh, that the Ghana came out from, came up from Nubia. And they take these three people, and which, which way, they tell us in the Bible here, this, this, this in Mankison is pertaining to Christ. Right? But they, 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 they tell us in the Bible here that uh, three wise men got out of Ethiopia and went into Egypt to see Christ. Now the way that this, they, they, they depict this in Manchester is, is that the Ghana came up from Nubia with these three great men with him to liberate, to liberate the part of uh, where is considered Ghana today. You know, so somewhere along the line, I'm confused about. I, I want to get to I am further confused because I have never heard of this, and I can't give you any uh, answer that may uh, help you in the bewilderment. There are men, there are all kinds of uh, story about the three wise men. Th that the three wise men is a Roman story, came out of the Roman church. Uh, there is no evidence of the ancient or early Christian writer who wrote this. Remember that the church had been into existence for a long time before that. It was in existence from Alexander. Alexandria, there was no such uh, uh, teaching. You know, when the church, when the group, the, the 200, 219 bishops met at Nicaea, uh, in 235, they put into the works a lot of things. For the Nicene Conference of Bishops, ordered by uh, uh, Constantine, the Roman Emperor, went and re remodeled the entire Christian church. They uh, expunged certain things out of the Bible, put in certain things, dropped certain 18 books, and so forth. So what you had as the original, frankly, they made Christianity Christendom. They Romanized it, and, uh, and that's what you got today. Unfortunately, we don't know this, and very few of the parishioners have any idea of this. And we stay to certain cliche terms, for instance. Everything in the Bible is the words of God inspired but how do, the same person saying this have no concept of what happened at the Nicene Conference. They have, for instance, if you got a Bible and it's the words of God, the original, then what happened with 219 men sitting down in a conference, taking out 18 books, revising this, uh, God, did God's word suddenly change? It is no longer inspired? Look what happened. The Roman Catholic Church put back the 18 books after editing them, and they now call them the Apocrypha. The Protestants have not put back one of them. In the book you read that, in the, in the Bible you read of the Book of the Dead, but nobody asked to, find, to see a copy of the Book of the Dead. If they wanted to see a copy, they could see it uh, for about $8, they could buy a paperback copy. But people, you see, we get so accustomed to uh, uh, being treated like Pavlov dog, that we respond like Pavlov dog. We only eat when the bell rings, even if we are hungry, and we will die rather than eat if the bell doesn't ring. Uh, we are comfortable in the pew sitting down, and somebody get up and tell us how to think, tell us what, what, what everything is, and we never question. And that, that's, 
that's, that's what happened in this particular case. You, you have different kind of information coming from all kind of people. Uh, just, uh, I, I, I hope I can quickly find something here that I was dealing on uh, the ordinances, which, which very few of us read, because there's some books in the Bible we don't read, we pass up. And ministers don't call it because it's convenient. The Jews are slave owners in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And I, I, I think I got it. Is it? I'm talking of the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 1 to 20. I'm not going to read the 20 chapters, just 20 verses. But this is in your Hebrew, your Old Testament, showing the Jews had slaves in their own book. But who called the Jews slave owners? Now these are the ordinances which you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, this is the Hebrews talking. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go out free. He shall serve seven, six years of, free, uh, of, of, of uh, slave labor. He shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and children shall be the masters and shall go out alone. But if the slave plainly says, quote, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost and his master shall bore his heir true with an all and he shall serve him for life. When a man sells his daughter and so on and so on. This is in the Bible. When last did you hear the minister, the rabbi, the priest call for that to be read? The Jews are slaveholders. <laughs> the same thing. The same thing, my brother. There are many, many, many different stories and uh, uh, versions of almost everything you could read. Because remember, the Bible wasn't written by a group of men or a man sit down here today, write it, except when John, well, uh, except, I should recant that statement, when Adonisus wrote the book of Revelation, not John, at the Nicene Conference, they couldn't find the book of Revelations, and Bishop Adonisa said he remembered it and he knew it word for word. And took two weeks and wrote the whole book of Revelations that John was supposed to have written. It's the same Adonisus that they murdered. They bust him with a chain in his head because he refused to vote on the virgin birth of Mary. Of, 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 of Mary. You know, it's not Jesus' virgin birth that they had for the... the um, what they call the, the, the market, but is, there's a thing, a celebration in the Roman church. It's called the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. It's not Mary's giving birth to Jesus. It is Mary mother's giving birth to her in an immaculate conception. For three generations, there were no intercourse in the family. <laughs> <laughs> and, and ask the average Christian, what is the, immaculate concept, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in the Roman Church? And they will tell you Jesus. It had nothing to do with Jesus. The feast is the feast of Mary, mother giving birth to her by Immaculate Conception. And very few Christians know it. So it depends. And, and when people like myself talk, the people are offended. But what I'm, I am very supportive. My, my wife is a Roman Catholic. Bless her soul. And, and, uh, and I, I sometimes have occasion to drive her to church and she has a little sepulchre and a little thing and, and I support her in it. Uh, some of my children are Roman Catholics and I got a daughter who's a Jehovah Witness and some grandchildren. So I got, all kind of, I got Muslim daughters and all kind of things. What I'm, what I'm dealing with is to get my children and others to understand what you're dealing with. 
Understand when you're talking about truth, you're talking about the Bible written by human beings. And you could say by God or something. I, yeah, I, uh, Sister Dobson, this idea comes to her from God. What do you mean by God? And how does God bring idea? How am I inspired? If I drink castor oil and start to work, I get an inspiration to go to the bathroom. If I don't, if I'm not, in, if I'm not inspired, my clothes are going to be inspired. <laughs> but you see, we get, car we, don't, we get carried away with certain words, the semantics. And we said, they were inspired by God. Now what do you mean by it? Ask the person what they mean by inspired by God. They think it's like a robot. The God just say, ping. And it says, <laughs> you know, it's nothing like that. An inspiration means a feelings. So you get inspired to do things too. No different than those guys who wrote the book. But it was no different. They're not special about it. They get an idea. And they felt good with the idea and wrote it down. So you're going to find all kinds of versions. <laughs> what that? Uh, I will have to repeat it. I think the mic is not working so well. Oh, the mics are for recording, not for the uh, voice projection. I was wondering if there was a process for those who are aspiring uh, to become scholars who wish they could go through some kind of extended process before they can do research in those areas that you have just made that deal with, with our children. The young man is asking, I mean, he stated that at one time I called for a group of scholars to go along the Nile and uh, to do some virgin research. And uh, he wondered if there was a process going on for that. No, there isn't a process because there isn't a single a scholar that uh, volunteered. What it means, you see, is uh, along the Nile, there's still some crocodiles and there's still some cobras and other things. Besides that, along the Nile, there's still some not being able to eat a hot meal every day and wear three-piece suit. Uh, with Brooks Brothers, you know what I mean, and, and drive a Mercedes Benz. It means sleeping out in the open, driving a jack, uh, riding a jackass, and that shouldn't be bad because Jesus rode one on Palm Sunday, and uh, that was the Cadillac of the day. Uh, uh, and, and all that kind of thing. No, the fact is no process because there's not a single brother who are going, who's going to take even a sabbatical to go along the Nile. It, it, to go in along the Nile means you can't eat as well, you can't sleep as well, you can't gouge yourself. You, you've got to go with little pickings, your money, your lecture, you keep and you dig in and you shovel and say, I got corns in my hand, you got to use a pick and shovel, you got to do all this. And brothers aren't ready yet uh, uh, to do this kind of work, to do research. We are only ready to go in the library, take up another white man book and research it. Go in it and say whether you, we agree or disagree. No, nothing is being done in that direction. Peace, sister. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very honored. You will sign my book. We, uh, I, I'm going to sign books after Dr. Lois has arrived, and when they're finished, this, I think they're going to be a place I'll sit and sign books. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. If you had a message right now to President Aristide and the people of Haiti, what would it be? If I had a message, to President Aristide or any one of them, I would tell him, I would tell him, stop being a priest and be a president. Uh, you can't, like, like Mama used to say, if you, if you're on the part, son, if you go, excuse me, friend, if you can shit, shit, and get off the part. 
you know, Mama, Mama was quite explicit. Aristide wants to be a priest and president. One of Haiti's problem is the Roman Church, and I, I, you I got it I, you know, for years. Haiti still suppresses the indigenous people's church, their religion. God Vodum is as important to me as any other God. It is the concept of a people coming together, expressing their culture, and the ultimate, the, the most, the ultimate way of expressing a culture is in the deity. It's not whether I like it or, or I like what the people are saying or how they practice their faith. But what made Haiti independent was not Roman Catholicism, it wasn't Jesus, it was first Neg Yosef. Uh, Macandal, Buckman, and then Toussaint and others. But it came out of a spirit and charge against the Frenchmen, and it was through the church that they got the, the, the church or meeting place or whatever they call it. I'm not familiar with the call it but they hall, the meeting place, where they came as worshippers of voodoo, with the teachings of voodoo. And I want to make it clear, well, when you all got your uh, peacock and, and chicken and cutting them up and things, that has nothing to do with voodoo. That's witchcraft. And I don't even call it negromancy. Pure nonsense. And, and what Haiti needs is the recognition of anybody's religion. And they don't need Roman Catholicism to be back. Because Roman Catholicism and the French, Haitian wanted to be Frenchmen. Let's be honest with ourselves. And when the independence came, with the men that led the independence and gained independence, then shortly after the church, they, they, they went back to Roman Catholicism and went back to French consideration. The French culture put me in mind of, uh, uh, of, of Sanghor. In um, what place name it? who left the presidency of, of uh, Senegal and go to France to become a corrector of French, to make the French knowledge, to stay in Senegal and said, if you don't have French culture, you're not cultured. If he has said, take his group, his cultural group, if you don't have men the culture, you're not cultured, I could understand it. Though I would not accept it, but at least He's a Mende. But to say in a former French colony, if you don't have French culture, you're not cultured. Indeed. Anybody who it in the in the indicate the, the height the height of assessness. <laughs> and that is the same thing that Aristide is no better than the one man that he's going to replace. One is a, with a killer with a machine gun. The other one is a killer with a Bible. White man, uh, One love, Father, and thanks for your life. Thank you, man. And I'd ask you a question. The question is about Melchizedek and Abraham. In Genesis, it tells us Melchizedek was a high priest, and Abraham being taken as an offering of his words. Is that a fact? So is that a thing? I don't know. Uh, I know that there is no physical evidence of an Abraham. In every religion, and I, I was born in the Hebrew religion, uh, I'm what they call a falasha. And I grew up in it, and to a young boy when I started to get, uh, when, I, when a young pre, uh, Pentecostal young fellow named Leonard, a friend of mine, we played sports, young boys, and we had a game called Hands in the Pooch. And if you don't put your hand like this, boy will kick you, you get kicked. And Leonard was never in our sports. He was a model young man. He got kicked and his, his um, testicle got ruptured and he died. I was told that I couldn't go to his funeral. I could march with the kids in the march, but when we reached in the church, I couldn't enter the church. And I asked why, he says, because it's not the house of God. And of course, 
They were told they couldn't come to the synagogue. It wasn't the house of God, and so on and so on. I was about 17 years, and I start then to worry why. If these are places of the house of God, why you can't go from one to the other? It is in conjunction with your answer. Because all religions are based primarily on mythology and allegory. Who can tell you when God start the world? And why isn't God a female when it's more logical that things come from female, most things? Even though a male. I know now that it needs a male to deal with a female in most cases to start something. But one time I even believed that I, I, I had an ego, man. I, I, I passed a baby, man. I, I just made me a baby. And I, it's a long time before I found out no baby came out of my scrotum. Do you know? I was shocked to find that I didn't pass no baby. I passed some sperms. And if them sperms had dropped in the ground, go in a ton of water, go upstream, and no, and no egg came down there to greet them, nothing would have happened but a lost sperm. See, then my little ego got down to size. And then I realized I got to do the tango together with mama. You know how it is. And I got myself and my ego got back in place and now I, I feel bad. That is the same thing with this. The story of Abraham, the story of all of this, the foundation of any religion, ain't got nothing to do with truth. Not truth as you know it, reality, but truth in what, what they're trying to do. A moral story, like Adam and Eve. Nothing wrong with Adam and Eve, it's the truth, morally. Not truth, realistically. You don't believe that God take a male now, take Adam. Got a whole master plan. Some dirt, some water, some snap in his nose, <laughs> blow the snap, Adam jump up. Yeah, boss. <laughs> boss, I'm lonely. How the hell he know he's lonely? <laughs> Ain't nobody there for him to talk to his own. So, so the boss put him to sleep, took a rib out. There ain't no hole left to show the rib. Took a rib out and made Eve. Out of rib? What happened with the falling over the mud? Uh, God didn't know how to make no more dirt, no more mud, mud pie. I mean, let's, let's get it now. It's, we're big enough, we're old enough, we don't have to follow this, that, that, that child's story. Then God knows everything. But Adam and Eve sinned. They had some sweet sex. They sinned. And I got to thank, sisters, I thank you. Because that stupid Eve, Adam was there doing nothing. <laughs> Eve had to get some sense and tell the fool, come on, man. Nobody <laughs> you see, I, I, that's why I love sisters, because sisters go fool around, they get the thing done. <laughs> and then, <laughs> man, and then, after the sin, they went behind this fig tree and got a fig leaf. <laughs> Have you ever seen a fig leaf, brother? Okay, they got a fig leaf. And God knows everything. So Adam and Eve ducking behind the fig leaf. Before that, he didn't know she was a woman, the blind. At least he could feel I didn't have no chest like that. <laughs> and she could feel like Papa Daniel didn't have no bulging up like that. But they went behind the leaf. And then God said, Adam and Eve, where art thou? <laughs> but we don't stop to see the moral stories upon which they have to base. Nobody wants to admit that he learned from the next one. So he creates a whole new beginning. And that's what I'm saying. I am a, I, 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 does, do I believe I'm going in an airplane tonight? Do I believe in, in, in a deity or something? 
I don't know a particular deity to put my hand on, but I believe there's something or things, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care if it's a piece of doodle. I, yeah, it sounds bad, somebody say, oh, why not? Why can't do the big God? How are you going to decide what God is? God may be a trump of doodle. <laughs> why not? Are you going to decide what God is going to be? Who are you to say what God is? I know God is whatever God is. And God, Goddess, whatever. I see myself like I take some blood and put it under a microscope. All those little things jumping around in there. You don't see it when you, when you, right now. But when you put it in the microscope, there it, there it is. Now why not me? I am there. I don't know. I believe. I'm groping in ignorance like all the ministers, all the rabbis, all the imams. That we are all groping, trying to find an answer. And when we find that God is a black woman from Puerto Rico, drinking green whiskey, boy, we're going to be shocked. <laughs> Right now, as you know, for the last few years, I have been, he had, the brother asked what kind of research I'm doing right now. Uh, I am for the last few years, you know, we're digging in what is called Nubian area, but really Nubian area is much larger than, than the current area. And I'm trying to add uh, to the information I was showing. Uh, in 1957 and around there, I was showing the Nubian origin of Egypt, the Meru Meruan object of Nubia, the Aksum ob uh, uh, origin of uh, Meroi, etc. Uh, going back to the, to the central point of the Nile Valley where the civilization, using the fact that Hunefa, uh, the scribe and priest, said that the Egyptians came from that source and the papyrus of Hunefa. I am trying to go back and I did uh, effectively wrote on this. I notice now that even the University of Chicago is now putting out paper of the, they call it, Nubian Black Influence and in Egypt. <laughs> uh, Nubian Black Influence and in Egypt. I don't understand their semantics, but uh, at least we know that they're stunned and they got no choice, but gradually they're going to come to the truth. But I don't give a damn if they do or not. Uh, what I'm interested in is that our people get the, the message and come to the truth. I don't care. See, some people said they got to educate the world. I'm not trying to educate the world. I'm trying to deal with the brothers and sisters uh, because the world haven't taken time in educating me to truth. So what I'm doing now is uh, relegated to that, and as they said, uh, it's slow because I'm dealing, I have eight brothers who work with me, Nubian brothers, not one of whom uh, has been to a university and they don't have to. I'm one of those that believe that university, all university does is to make a curriculum where you could go from a set of prescribed learning. But you could do the same thing outside of that university, providing that you don't plan to go to European looking for a job. But if you, if you, you can do it, uh, because mo the best of our writers in our group, and I'm not saying don't go to college, don't get a PhD, but I'm saying don't look at your son or your daughter because they didn't go as if the end has happened. Because uh, J.A. Rogers and all those fellows are some of our best writers, and many of them didn't go in European schools. So I'm, I'm doing field research, digging with a shovel and a pick, and so, in between flying and lecturing and, and getting back to Egypt. And in the future, what would you like to see us do? Uh, one question, please. And uh, I need to say this. Uh, when this brother finishes, this is the last question. We're running out of time. Oh, okay. So uh, you can let him go. Thank you. <laughs> Don't forget, I got two questions, and I think the first one, I only can find the one. I didn't think of the first one until uh, I came up here. I'll ask you that question first. Um, you mentioned Aristide. Yes. I was wondering how uh, his situation applies to us in this country. 
The question I want to ask you is, uh, Brother, do you think... Brother, one question. I'm sorry. One question. Well, I'm still... It's not just one question. Going to the same question. Mm -hmm. One question. I'll say the other one. Okay. But the question I want to ask you is simply, do you think men of the cloth can be true revolutionaries? See, see, Brother, that's... Now, I'm not going to argue with you because it takes more time, but we have to respect each other. He said one question. That's well, that's we the mean. question, sir. One question. That's the question. No, I don't. See, it's not the saying that religion is separate from social order. I'm not saying that because religion is an outgrowth of culture, not culture the outgrowth of religion. Man made religion to sanctify his best. When man come up with some philosophical thought, he says the deity gave him this thought. So to me, I am religious in that concept. Now, when Brother Alistair decided to leave the priesthood, and he didn't, he didn't renounce the priesthood, he's still a priest, still subjective to the dictates of Rome, this is my point, that when Rome, he does something, he must, uh, it's just, it's different to the Baptist minister, Baptist minister got nobody over him, there's no bishops, I mean, he, his board, and some of them don't even have a board. Okay. Uh, uh, Aristide and Jesse is different. Jesse is, is the master of Jesse. Aristide has a master not only in Rome, he has a master in Haiti called Bishop. Now, oh, less than that, called Monsignor. One step above him, two steps above him, all the way up until he get to the Pope. And my point is this. He cannot do anything that isn't approved by Rome. And that's the, the, the point, that, and to me, Aristide is invalid as long as he's got that over his head. Yes, I, sister asked, sister stated that I had said in my lecture that the he, there's no archaeological evidence or, or historical evidence as the Hebrews are slaves in Egypt. I remember And she said that she recalled one of a professor had uh, mentioned that the Hyksos was the progenitors of what is today the Hebrews or the Hebrew race. I didn't even know there was a Hebrew race, but uh, I, had, I thought it was a Hebrew cultural group. Uh -huh. All right. A professor said that, but he didn't, sub he didn't submit the evidence of what he stated. There were a group of people in Egypt called the Hyksos. The Hyksos information they left had no part. What happened is the Hyksos and the Jewish, the Jewish writers write about their entrance at the same time when the Hyksos was similarly entering. We have evidence of the Hyksos. We don't have any evidence of the Hebrews. To say that the Hebrews were in fact people who descended from the Hyksos, where is the evidence? what it is that the Hebrews did or are doing that the Hyksos did. And there's no evidence of the two of these people. Yes, by their statement they try to put the two. The Hyksos came in Egypt and destroyed the 13th dynasty. Uh, at the time when they came in it would be around uh, 1675 before the common era. The Hyksos were expelled in the 17th dynasty, destroyed uh, Amus, a pharaoh from what is today uh, called Luxor. The Greeks once called it um, Thebes. The indigenous people call it Waset. Amus came with organized because the Hyksos didn't come further than the Delta. They went as far as a place called Avris, where they make, made the capital. Now, Amus organized the southern lords and they came and attacked the Hyksos. 
Amos was killed. Amos' son, Tatmus, you know, you hear the names? Where they're going to get a name Moses from? All of this, they're going to create a Moses. Tatmus continued to fight at a Tatmus one until he got killed and his daughter, Makari Hasabsut, took over. It was to be his son, but his son was of very minor age and his daughter took over. Now, she and her son, Tutmos III, finished the expulsion of the uh, Hyksos, and that would be in the 18th dynasty. There, there is all that evidence. There isn't a single evidence of a people called Haribu, Haripu, Hebrew, any other way you want to call it, much less Jew, because Jew would be, uh, Jew would come from the word Yehuda, uh, which, or Judah, which, and that would be only one tribe, the tribe that was supposed to be in control in the military. But you can't, because none of this could be documented. For instance, Moses just come up, go in the, 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 the temple, uh, the, the, the Pharaoh's daughter goes down to the water, to the Nile, to take a swim and, and find him there in a basket. The same story of Horus, the diff only difference between Moses and Horus is that Moses was in a uh, bulrush basket and Horus, 4,000 years before, was in a, 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 a papyrus basket. But the question is, the Pharaoh was supposed to be killing, they don't give the Pharaoh a name, and Pharaoh just means the king or the head of state. The Pharaoh was supposed to be killing all little boys that they couldn't validate, validate as, as, as Egyptian. Now Moses is supposed to be born in the city of Goshen in Egypt, about 25 miles north of present day, day Cairo. And his daughter brought in a child in the house. The father doesn't ask his daughter where you get that child, a boy child, and he kill him boy child, children, and he don't look like anybody in the kingdom, you understand? And the boy grew up there from age a few months till 85 when he find out. At 85 he saw a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian. Aren't the Hebrews in Egypt the time? He, Egyptians don't? Is there a Hebrew nation? They don't Hebrew nation. They don't know Israel yet. Israel doesn't going to come until Joshua knocked down the, the walls of Jericho. <laughs> I mean, God. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've got to go through all this allegory and all this folklore and then understand when you're talking about origin, you're talking about sheer pipe dream. If, if there was, if you could have been on high end and grass, uh, of, or, or what that crack, and you come up with the same thing. When you talk about origin of these things, when you talk, remember that you set a story, a fantasy for yourself. We all have fantasy. When I see a girl, I hope my wife can hear this, but when I see a nice looking thing, even these days, and I will see too much, but I see a nice looking sister like yourself. <laughs> and I get them kind of cool on you, you know what I mean? I fantasize all three. <laughs> down to nothing. <laughs> but the way these girls are dressing now, you can't even do no fantasizing. <laughs> you see everything, you can't even fantasize. Yeah. But I got you fantasized even to every little speck of every little thing. You understand? I know where every little thing at. And most of the time, when you say, yeah, baby, and I get there, so damn it, this is why I say it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm saying is, we all make projections, and religion starts with projection. 
the, the, the theory of the beginning is a projection. Who was there to write down what happened in the beginning? And when they talk about the world, what was the world of the Jews? The world of the Jews wasn't 500 miles radius. The, the world of Genesis, nobody knew about um, Queens. No, I mean the Indians, know, the indigenous people know. And nobody knew nothing about China in, the, in, the, in their world. Their world was end with a mountain, top end. Behind a mountain they didn't know. And that was the world. When they talk about the world, they were talking about America and the Caribbeans. They didn't know any such place. So the world for them, when, when they, when they, when they, eight on five and ten men head, the world went to an end. And she was right, there's a big tall car in her head, when the ten said, oh, your world going to an end. <laughs> so her little world with an acorn was, was real. So in, in reality, they are, they are biblical truths, but not necessary physical truths. Peace. Uh, my question is just basically uh, this scene uh, that is found out in the temple, I don't know which temple I'm going to do, because I'd like to answer, of a uh, uh, being led in to meet Osiris by Anubis. Uh, uh, that's in, uh, excuse, Edfu, the temple of uh, Horus the Elder. And I believe there's something associated with it called the 42 Confessions. Oh, that's not the 42 Confessions. The the, well, it's called Admonitions to Goddess Ma'at or 42 Negative Confession. Negative because it starts, I have not, the denial. I have not made light by bushel. I have not killed men or women. I have not. And 42 of them. Uh, uh, negative confession is just because I have not done. It is not, they don't call it commandment because it doesn't say, thou shall not or you should not. Meaning, if we found, found if they found, and it's found, 4100, a document that is revised, saying I have not, it means then that the command do not do is even older. So that there are older works that we have not yet found. All right. The, the, um, Admonitions that most people see, you will see it best in the tomb of Ramesses the sixth in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, it is right next, right up against the uh, tomb of Tutankhamun. That tomb, Ramesses the sixth, obscure, that's why they couldn't find Tutankhamun. The dirt that was dug out of that tomb was thrown and the little tomb for Tutankhamun. It's on the right hand side of the going in the temple on the right hand side when you enter the temple you come through you see the book there in the ceiling the book of gates opening of the gates then you go down and you will see the god uh, you will see the, the killer the crusher um, Amut that looks like a crocodile head and a, and a lion's body uh, another lion arm um, hippopotamus body because Hippopotamus, the ancient Egyptian, used the Hippopotamus as a symbol of the devil, of badness. Then you come to the, you see Goddess Ma'at holding a scale of justice, two level scale, no, no, no sword. Uh, the next scene after the, the person comes in to have his heart symbolically weighed against the feather of truth, and the heart and the, and the feather balance. The next step is uh, the coming to the judgment scene. There you will see the listed, the listed 42 uh, uh, admonitions to God as my, my act. Uh, although they listed after you pass, but frankly, the person is making the statement as they approach God as my act. Now again, peace, justice, and everything, a woman an African woman with an Ethiopian uh, ostrich feather in the cent standing in the center of her head. Uh, again, 
you're talking about symbolism, you're talking about allegory, you're talking about a mythology. It, it doesn't mean that, that what the Egyptians and others saw is correct or incorrect. It's the, what it shows is the beliefs of the people at the time. And there's nothing wrong with belief, but we must say it, it is a belief rather than try to make it better than anybody's old. I, 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 I go with that in preference to something else, but I do know it is the, the, the behavior, the, the thinking of man's mind, the greatness of man's, both male and female, by, when I say man, the thinking of the mind of human in conception, because we, do, we can't think of dying and not having a further existence. Our ego don't let us say, this is it, this is all. But we find that the elephant isn't going to live. When he croak today, that's it. But when we croak, we coming back. <laughs> For what? I, 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 it's, you better get it now. You may not come back. And I wouldn't want, some people I know, some sisters are gone on, I wouldn't want to meet them in heaven because they don't, they don't really got a, a thing to tell me about. And I don't want to see them in hell or heaven, because I have a rough time. <laughs> so let, I, I guess if I don't come back, I don't go anywhere, I'll probably be better off. <laughs> asking in view of my research and in view of the fact that quote his mind our minds have been messed up by the Europeans uh, in context of racism and genocide I don't I don't take the position that our minds are messed up our information uh, is faulty but I think our mind is sound what we put in the information we feed into our mind is messed up but that doesn't mean that we can't put our mind back on track most of us or all of us I, I myself I was pretty well messed up as a young man my parents did it to me not intended to do me harm but to do me a lot of good from day one I was forced into certain information and fed certain information until I started to question certain things when my mother, a midwife, when I questioned childbirth, then my mother started to tell me some truths that I couldn't get from the Torah about childbirth as a midwife. And I said, Mom, why did you tell me to the, to the country? She says, if I tell you at five years old this information, how are you going to deal with it? And then my father similarly, she said, it is when you ask, now I can tell you the truth. Uh, when my mother explained sexual intercourse to me and told me that that's how I came, I was mad. Because I couldn't see my mother and father doing a dirty thing like that. I mean, anybody's mother could do that now, but not my mother and father. And I, then I had to ask her, why you wait so long? And I went to the school, I was pretty well upset that my mother and father engaged in such nonsense. <laughs> but uh, at least they explained it. Some parents don't ex explain it any time. Uh, so I don't think our mind is messed up. What we need is more of what we are doing. What we need most of all, however, is that we need a relationship with the minister, the rabbi, the imam, and ourselves quite different than the Europeans structured it. We can't continue with the relationship of the minister Rabbi Iman this way and you there 
and we're in a different relationship to each other that doesn't bring the man here there and you here. We have to have the Richard Allen, the, the, the Denmark Vesey, the Nat Turner relationship to the congregation where we see each other as one and we are not in a fight between the minister and the congregation for knowledge. We have to have in the church, the synagogue and the mosque, libraries dedicated to our culture and history. We must preach from the pulpit, not only going to heaven, if there's such a place, or hell, but how we are going to make it on earth. Uh, the church, again, the black ministry, going to have to again get in the struggle with the people that support it. I, I don't mind supporting paying 10, I'll increase by 10% if my leader, spiritual leader, is going to be actively engaged. What happened is that the black spiritual leader doesn't understand he or she is the only independent black man or woman. The black church is going to support the leadership. Don't care. Or the only way the black church will get angry is if the leader steals some money. <laughs> but they ain't going to get angry because they have another sex partner or nothing like, like, like that. You found that when they tried to destroy Martin Luther King by saying he had some extra woman. We're supposed to be running around the place all the time, can't get to what's her name. And the, the, the brother's the tank is running dry. The, the brother, brother got to the soup up the tank and everything like that. Then he ain't nothing to, to condemn the man, but you know what I mean? But the struggle, the struggle is if, if this is in the church and the minister don't have time for this, he only have time to talk about going to heaven. That's no good. I can't go to heaven if I ain't living. When if I'm doing bad, I can't even pay the fare to get to heaven. The car, the heavenly being gonna left me back. He's got to work with me. Like Harriet Tubman and all of them, and the ministers in those days, they all walked together as one. Not Turner, then McVeasy, when, when they, were, they came out to burn the cane field with the members. The baptismal, you see this thing here? The baptismal thing in the church, that wasn't for beauty. It wasn't just good architectural design. The church, Build this where the members, when the slave master, I'm going to finish here, when the slave master was coming, they immediately filled the tank with water. And the slave went in the tank up, at the back, put his nose to the air hole. And the sisters immediately start singing and dressed in their robes, wet down. And they came down the aisle, wet and the water running. Dogs can't smell in water. And that way the slave was saved. And the jumping, you see the minister jumping out just stupidly without any reason. That was to signal the slave that the master coming. And he makes certain jump. Now they just jump for joy. Uh, all, all this, the underground was successful because this was the coordination between the church and the congregation and the minister. But now we are separated. Those on the board of trustees figure, and the boards of the boards of deacons, and each everybody in the church is at a different level instead of just working by title, working together. We gotta get back our attitude.